We're live. Here we are again, getting into uh, chapter three a little bit more deeply. This is the second um, lecture in terms of sales. And so what we want to do is go to page uh, 74 and 75. And as you look at the second column, you see transport across the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane, remember, is a phospholipid bilayer with proteins all through it uh, and on top of it. And that makes a very nice barrier, controls what goes in, controls what comes out. And so um, homeostasis is being achieved. As you look into the learning outcomes, you see describe the energy requirement for and the mechanism by which solute movement occurs in simple and facilitated diffusion. And describe the process of osmosis in the direction of solvent movement and then compare and contrast the effects of hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic conditions. So as you look at this first column, one of the things, one of the terms that you need to be very familiar with is you come down the first paragraph in this second column and you see the bold print term that says selectively permeable. Now you're selectively, um, I wouldn't want to call it permeable, but you're selective in terms of who you let in your house or who you let out of your house. If you've got a one-year-old, you don't let them crawl out on the porch and down the, the uh, steps and so you get, some, get them problems. So um, the cell membrane is selectively permeable. What's got to get across the cell? We'll come down to the second uh, paragraph in that second column, and you'll see it says substances are being exchanged all the time. Come on down about three or four lines, and you'll see it says it, it'll list glucose, and amino acids, and fatty acids, all those things that we eat, plus water, and we take in oxygen and so forth, vitamins, and then you've got things that come out of the cell carbon dioxide, waste products that maybe your kidneys are going to get rid of or whatever. So um, there's always an exchange going on 24-7. Of course, it might slow down a little bit when we go to sleep tonight, but it's going. If we, When it stops, can we just say we're dead in the water, right? Now, Come down to the last paragraph in that second column and you see the bold print terms, passive transport and active transport. As you look at the last um, passive, that well, before we go there, passive doesn't require any energy. Active does require energy. But I want you to look at the last three, four lines of that little paragraph and it says, um, The type of substance crossing the membrane is important, can determine whether it's passive or active. The, the membrane's permeability, you know, water and oil don't mix. And so we've got this same situation here with the, with the plasma membrane. And then the concentration of the substance, whether it's inside the cell or outside the cell. So those are variables in terms of moving things across the membrane, either coming out or either going in. So let's look at passive transport for just a minute. Remember that doesn't uh, require any energy. And you get a little flashback here, what's a concentration gradient? Here it is, we, that was back in chapter one. Now here it is in three, and it's gonna show up all during the course of the semester. So you, you wanna remember what a concentration gradient is, what are solutes and solvents also? So look back in there on page 35, they even give you the page so you don't have to go hunt for it. Now, pack, passive transport, two types, diffusion and osmosis. And you see diffusion, you see is, is gives, gives you a definition, is defined, at, not defined, but defined as the movement of solute not solvent, movement of solute molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So if you have an area of high concentration and you got an area of low concentration, you have a gradient. Just like you got a grade when you go up or down the mountains in North Carolina, you're on a grade a lot of times. 
And so it says there's such a gradient involves a difference in the concentration of a substance from one area to the other. Now, look over in the second column and look at the second paragraph. Diffusion allows solids to move into and out of the cell using the potential energy of a concentration gradient. Potential energy. You got a lot of chemical up here, very little down here. You have a concentration gradient and it can drive the movement of molecules to another area toward equilibrium type situation. Now, as you look at this, the second line of the second paragraph in the second column. It says a solid is said to move down from high to low, down or with its concentration gradient from a higher to lower concentration during the process of diffusion. So what you see up top on page 75 is that um, membrane, plastic divider in that beaker and it's got all these glucose molecules on one side and very few on the right side. 50% concentration of, of glucose versus 5%. So you got more glucose on the left than you do on the right. It'll stay like that because they can't get through the barrier. As soon as you remove the barrier, they move to the right. They move down the concentration gradient and they achieve what they seek to achieve. I don't think they consciously do that. Glucose doesn't have a brain. We burn it. But anyway, you get to the point where you look on the third beaker and you see they're spread out evenly. And that's what we call equilibrium. So there are things that can move from the outside to the inside of our cells. There are things that move from the outside, inside to the outside, simply by diffusion. Look at the bottom, the last question, excuse me, the last paragraph on page 75. The rate of diffusion depends on several factors. You can include the size of the, of the um, solute. You go on down underneath there and you see the temperature. If it's warmer, it moves more quickly and the size of the concentration gradient. Now let's go over to, to page 76. And what we want to do is come down in the first column to where you see uh, the second paragraph, the barrier to diffusion into and out of cells is the plasma membrane. So you see two basic, two basic types of diffusion occur through a membrane, simple and facilitated. Still diffusion. They don't require any energy. Simple diffusion mostly involves nonpolar solutes. Nonpolar. That means they share their electrons equally, right? And you think of the hydrocarbons, lipids and so forth, fats, triglycerides and all that. And then the gases like O2 and CO2. Remember CO2, you had the C in the middle and two oxygen on either side. That's a nonpolar covalent bond. And it says those pass straight through the phospholipid bilayer. See, they don't have a charge on them. And they can pass right through it, right through the phospholipid layer without assistance from a membrane, a, a membrane protein. Uh, something like benzene. You may have heard of benzene, but uh, it can get into your bloodstream and it can just move right into your cells and create problems if you get exposed to it enough. Just moves right on through your membrane. There's, there are things that actually can be absorbed by our skin, and they're usually nonpolar uh, substances. Facilitated diffusion involves a charged or pol polar solutes, ions, and things like glucose. Remember, these carbohydrates are uh, polar. Crosses the phospholipid bilayer with the help of a membrane protein. So they need that, that membrane protein. So again, and you look at the next paragraph, it talks about the nonpolar molecules like oxygen uh, moving through the phospholipid bilayer without any problem. Fatty acids, 
like we take in. Hopefully you take in the polyunsaturated fatty acids. It'll be good for you. But you come down to facilitated diffusion, fatty acids of the phospholipid bilayer won't interact with polar solids. So it makes it difficult for them to get through there to cross the membrane. And it says, for this reason, these solids usually rely on two types of membrane proteins, channels and carriers. Look at the top of the page. In the very center of figure 3.7, you see these channels. And there's where various polar substances can enter and exit. It works. It works fine. Been here 73 years and mine's been working real good. You probably got 18 or 20 years on you and they're still working good. So you got channel proteins and then you have to the right what they call carrier proteins, which literally open up, grab a polar or an ionic substance, close, bring it into the cell and open up and pop it right into the cytosol. So it doesn't take any energy, but it's the changing of this protein. And so you, you want to know you've got two different proteins there, carriers and channels. Carriers will literally get a hold of the, the substance, whatever it might be, bring it in, drop it off. Channels are open all the time. Molecules can get through there. Does not cost any energy. And don't go down here and get into the uh, uniporter, antiporter, and symporter. That's, that's nice, but it, we're not going to get into it. As you look at the last paragraph before you get to osmosis, says, don't forget, facilitated diffusion is a type of passive transport, even though it requires help of a protein. It's passive, doesn't cost anything. The cell expends no energy. Look at the last sentence. Both processes rely on the potential energy of the concentration gradient. Remember, the higher the gradient, faster it's going to occur. So, that's passive transport. Now let's look at this next section called osmosis. Osmosis also is another um, passive transport event. And this can get a little tricky, but I think I think you can handle it if we say it correctly. Now notice what it says about the process of osmosis. If someone asks you, what is osmosis? Here's what you want to say. The movement of a solvent, not the solute like salt or sugar or whatever, but the solvent, that's the liquid. In our case, it's going to be water. Got a lot of water in this body. It says the dissolving medium across a selectively permeable membrane from a solution with a lower solute concentration to a solution with a higher solute concentration. So the water moves toward, through a semipermeable membrane, toward the um, area where the solute is in higher concentration. I want you to think about this for just a minute. How many of you like to eat pancakes and syrup? Like to put a lot of maple syrup on there? I usually like to have a few pancakes with my syrup. I like maple syrup. And so I eat these pancakes, haven't done it for a long time, but you probably have had some in the last year or two. We used to eat them all the time. And you know what? Invariably, after eating that breakfast, my mouth was dry. Why is that? Because of osmosis. There was more sugar in the maple syrup in my mouth, then there was 
sugar in the cells that make up the oral membrane. So water comes out of the membrane into the pancakes. That's osmosis. And of course, I'm looking for something like uh, something to drink, maybe some water or some orange juice or something like that. So that's what osmosis is. It's the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane from an area that has lower solute to an area that has greater solute. Look at the picture up top, figure 3A. As you look on the left side of the beaker, you see the green dots, and that's your glucose. Got four dots over there. And you look over here to the right, and you see you got about eight or ten of them. Notice the arrow where the little, see the little oxygen and the two hydrogens? See how they go through the semipermeable membrane over to where the greater glucose molecule concentration is. You know what our ancestors used to do? Some of you like salt, don't you? My wife likes salt. I like pepper. But you put uh, salt on your french fries or on your corn. You like, you know, good uh, field corn coming out, uh, silver queen and all that stuff. And you cook it and put that salt and butter on there. And, oh, it's just, it's wonderful. You could eat three or four years, couldn't you? We used to put salt on meat when we didn't have refrigeration. We put salt on the meat and there's real concentrated. So it drew the water out of the meat into the salt on the outside and no bacteria would live on it. That's how you kept meat. Didn't have a refrigerator out there in the woods. So you had to use salt. So that's what's happening up there. That's the movement of that water out from an area where there is lesser solute to an area where there is greater solute. That's osmosis. How does it get through? Look on page 77. And you see in the first column through water channels called aquaporins. Most of it goes through those little pores. And then it says between phospholipids in the membrane. Now, water is polar. But the lipid portion of the phospholipid Membrane is not polar, but look at your last three lines. Water is able to pass mostly because it's a tiny little molecule and the size helps it get through. Okay. Now let's look at how this plays out sometimes in our body. Look on page 78. And you see the second column, tonicity. And that's a way of comparing the solute concentrations of solutions. We've got three words. Some of you already know these, don't you? I hope you do. You see isotonic. That means two solutions are equal to each other. Look on page 79. Look at the figure 3.9. You see the red cell up top? The number of solute particles in the red blood cell is about the same as that on the outside. If you see the little corner, see that little box there? Tiny little box, and then it opens up with those uh, dashes, and you see that in the cytosol, that's inside the red blood cell, is about the same concentration as the extracellular fluid. So they are equal, isotonic. And that's the way we stay for the most part until we go out and exercise or whatever uh, and burn off some sweat, um, calories and so forth. So there's no, no movement of water to any consequence. Okay. But if you look down to the left on page 79, you see under there B, Hypertonic solution. Hyper, you already know that means above, greater. So this one is more concentrated. The solution is more concentrated. 
than what is in the red blood cell. There are more, whatever those little, uh, let's say they're sodium ions. You got more sodium ions on the outside than you do inside the cell. Look at your diagram again to the right. You see the little box and then the little dashes. The cytosol has one, two, three, four, we'll say four sodium. And then look over to the right on the other side of the membrane, there's a dozen. So water moves out of the cell and you see how it's got that funny shape. They call it crenated, C-R-E-N-A-T-E-D, crenated. I see that a lot of times when we draw kids' blood in microbiology and we do blood typing and so forth. And um, when they come in sometimes in the morning, they haven't had anything for 10 or 12 hours and they come in and their cells look like that. I said, you haven't had anything to drink yet. No coffee, no no milk, no water, no uh, orange juice or anything. No, I haven't had that, Mr. Pritchett. So you can dehydrate the red blood cells by having too much solute in your bloodstream or in the extracellular fluid. It'll pull the water right out of the red blood cells. Now, look over to the right and you see hypotonic. The solution in which the red blood cell goes into is hypotonic. Prior to that, it was hypertonic, wasn't it? But it's hypotonic now. So as you look at the red cell, and there's that little square again, you look at the dotted lines, inside the cell, there's a lot of, um, let's say sodium again, but it's real low in the extracellular fluid. So the water tends to go toward where the greater concentration of the solute is. That's what happened with the maple syrup. And all the water comes out of my mouth. And I'm all dried up after that. They had a sad situation at the University of Georgia where they had a, a fraternity um, get together and they were getting inducted into the fraternity and they made this kid drink um, just pure water. And it diluted the substances in the bloodstream and moved into the cells of his brain where they had more solute in the brain cells. And he died from cerebral edema. Water is good for you. Homeostasis, you got to have that balance. If you don't do that, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Okay. So... So much for osmosis. You want to go over to page 80 and do your quick check. Make sure you do that. Got some good questions there. Now we want to look at active transport through membrane proteins. This requires energy. It says active, you'll be spending ATP. That's why we've got to eat and we turn that food into ATP so that Active transport can take place, and we have homeostasis. As you uh, look in this first little paragraph, and it says, the use of energy is necessary because unlike in diffusion, if we have high level like this, and you will go, go down to the lower level to, to get your equilibrium, solids move against, not with, their concentration gradient. That's why you need energy to put more stuff back up here. That's active transport. And so you see it says the concentration gradient does not provide any energy. You can bend a couple of lines there to drive the movement of the solutes. So you got to have some energy. So look at the next paragraph. Active transport requires carrier proteins called pumps. Now, there's several pumps. We're not going to get into all of those pumps, okay? We're not going to do that. We're going to be looking at just one kind of pump. And if you would, look on page 80, second column. And you come down to the second paragraph. It says two types of active transport. 
we're going to just deal with one. We're not going to deal with two. This, it just gets deeper than you need to get. But you see primary active transport and secondary active transport. Don't worry about secondary. It's only going to be tested on primary. And as you start to read the primary active transport, come down to the second line of pump. Okay. You guys know what a pump is, right? I think most of you do. Um, binds a solid and transports it against its concentration gradient using the energy from the hydrolysis. What is hydrolysis? Splitting with water, breaking off a of phosphate, and you get all this energy. It helps move that protein and that um, solid against the concentration gradient. The one we're interested in as you see in bold um, print there, the sodium potassium pump. That pump is working right now and it works 24 seven, just like your heart and my heart. Sodium potassium pump. It pumps sodium out of a cell. Let's say it's a nerve cell. It pumps sodium out of a cell. So there's more sodium on the outside, but it also pumps potassium on the inside, to the inside. It's not equal, but it's where it's supposed to be. So you'll read through that paragraph. It'll talk about the sodium being 10 times greater on the outside of the, the cell membrane as opposed to the inside. And then the potassium will be 10 times greater or so than on the outside. Look at the last sentence of that first paragraph. About three lines. Three gradients are required for skeletal muscles to contract, for the heart to beat, for nerves to send impulses, for cells to maintain osmotic balance. Homeostasis. This is another one of those mechanisms that helps to keep us nice and steady in terms of sodium on the outside of a cell, potassium on the inside. Now, as you look at the numbers, look at number one underneath that paragraph. The pump binds three sodium ions from the cytosol, come down to number three. The pump releases the three sodiums from the uh, extracellular fluid and bind, binds to potassium. So it's going to kick three sodium out. It's going to bring two potassium in. And that's the way we're built to work. Now, I want you to look over for just a moment. We've got a couple of more minutes here. I want you to look on page 82 and look down at the bottom, second column. And you see the plasma membrane. Above it, positive ions, a little positive charge, ECF extracellular fluid. Then you come down below where you see the little negatives, cytosol, that's inside the cell. So it's a, there's a little difference in the charge there. It's not, it's not completely equal. There's a little more of a positive charge on the outside, right next to the membrane, and a little bit of a negative charge on the inside. Now, having seen that, look on page 83. Now it says up at the top of that first column, note that this charge separation is limited to the area on either side of the plasma membrane, right next to it. So there's a little charge there. That's all we need is a little charge. And you see it says a separation of charges like the one we see here is known as an electrical potential. Now remember, potential is a possibility, right? Okay. The name refers to the fact that an electrical potential is a source of potential energy. Okay. Why is it, why is there potential energy? The answer is simple. An electrical potential is really an electrical gradient. You know, we were talking about glucose being up here and down here. 
across that membrane, more glucose up here. So you had a big concentration gradient. You got a concentration gradient here too, but it happens to be ions. And so they call it an electrical gradient. And that's potential energy. Now I'm wiggling my fingers and I'm spending that energy. That sodium potassium pump is, of course, is working all the time, but you know, we think of movement like that. And so it's got to establish that little potential, that little difference that makes all the difference in the world. So you come down in that paragraph and you're going to see membrane potential, electrophysiology, and then you come down to the next one and you see resting membrane potential. So when we're lying steady, steadily quiet in the bed and we're sleeping and our limbs are not moving, the nerves are charged. That's right, they got a charge. Just like a battery, you got to have charge. So resting membrane potential. And you see it's about minus 80 millivolts. Now, what I'd like for you to do in closing this is I want you to read about transport vesicles. Those are little sacs that transport things throughout the cells. And so you, you can look down and see endocytosis, which means it's going to take something into the cell. It's a little piece of the plasma membrane. It surrounds uh, a bacterium, pulls it into the cell, and the cell eats it. And then you look over to the right in the second column down at the bottom, you see pinocytosis. That's where a little vesicle will grab water and pull it into the cell. It's really this another piece of the cell membrane. And then we got to get rid of stuff. Exocytosis on page 84. And so whatever wastes are there, you have a little vesicle that can... You follow the directions here and you'll see it lines up with the, or attaches to the inside of a, a cell membrane. And they become one, it opens up and out goes the waste. Now, we're gonna knock off here, but we're gonna, I'm gonna try and get another video going for tomorrow. Page 87, the organelles that are in our bodies. And all those little metabolic machines that do all kinds of wonderful things, we're going to be talking about them. So we've got to do that. And then we've got protein synthesis. And we'll be finished with chapter three. Yeah, a week from, almost a week from today. Yeah, next Thursday. Yeah, not this coming, not tomorrow. Next Thursday, we're going to play ball. Okay. I'm going to hit you some good grounders. I'll see you later.